welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ryan Represent, and today I will be reviewing the Galaxy Watch Active 1. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO78. Watches! Uh, I have to tell you about this watch, but I have to tell you about watches in general first, because they sort of color my perspective about watches, and during this review, you should know about how I feel about them. I don't like watches. They touch my skin, and I feel them. I can feel it burning a hole into my body. I feel it. I don't like it. Uh, Basically, it's just that I'm not used to them. But I don't like watches because they touch my skin, and I feel it. But there are some other reasons that I don't really need a watch. I prefer ambient display on a phone. It turns out that ambient display works really well as a watch, especially since all of the phones that I have now very much do make use of ambient display technology. Whether it be a nice little colorized display or a full-on clock somewhere on the front side of the phone. It's kind of funny that uh, that particular function was popularized by Motorola, and then they came out with their watch, which was a long, long time ago, but only this year did we get a mass market smartwatch with always on support. So it's kind of funny that we still haven't caught up to all of the true functionality that a phone can offer. Now, even though I prefer ambient display, I kind of get in trouble all the time at work when I walk away from my phone because in order for ambient display to work, unlike a watch, you actually have to be able to see it and it kind of has to be on the table. You're not going to be holding your phone the whole time when you're working. So I do walk away from my phone, and then I am surprised when I have three messages and two missed meetings. So you just can't win sometimes. So I am reviewing the Galaxy Watch Active 1. Now, it's important to note that 1 there. This is not a review of the more recent Active 2, and the reason for that is when I ordered the Note 10 Plus in 2019 in August, and I received that phone, I was also given a coupon for another Samsung product that was already released at the time. You know, I could have bought a charging pad or a supercharger, but I opted for the watch. You know, another thing to review, another thing to try, even though I knew the Active 2 was coming around. So I have this instead, and I'm wearing it right now. Cool. Let's talk about the look and feel. We'll try to make sure that uh, you can imagine what a watch looks like. So imagine a circle. Imagine on a a rubber band. Uh, It's kind of a sporty band that it comes with by default. I think you can buy other bands of other colors. Of course, I would have preferred to have a red band, uh, you know, all that branding and all. But the the sporty plastic band is fine. It's um, fairly lightweight, I would say. It's not like it has to shift around in my arm whenever I shake my hands or anything. It's totally okay in that respect. But I still think it's a little too thick in my opinion. When I look at a watch and I see it going over my wrist, I I don't know what it feels like, six millimeters or so, but I don't know how measurements work. It's just too much. It's just too thick for my taste. Now, in terms of what the actual watch looks like when you're trying to use it, well, it's a glass screen in a circle format. I mean, it's not not anything revolutionary. It's a, it's a watch. Uh, it is nice in the sense that it has a big enough screen. It's not uh, not square. It's, it's circular, which is nice. But it does have a very thick bezel, in my opinion, uh, especially coming from Samsung's other product lines where the edges taper to the sides extremely aggressively, which I really like. And then in addition to that, the bezel is just so wide, it kind of beats up to the, the glass space. So even though you might be running your finger around the uh, display, you actually end up kind of running your finger around the bezel instead. Now, I believe in the Active 2, they actually make the bezel touch sensitive, so you can sort of use it as a scroll wheel, which is kind of a cool idea. Uh, that does not seem to be the case here. Instead, you just swipe left to right to scroll through apps, but we'll talk about that later. So in addition to the screen being a touch screen and interactable, you can also use one or both of the two buttons on the side Now, there is supposed to be some gimmicky thing where if you hold both buttons, you can summon Samsung Pay, or you can summon the, like, power button, I guess. So there are some cool things you can do with uh, the the two buttons together, but the primary functions for those two buttons 
one is a back button and one is a home button. So if you hit the home button, it'll take you home from wherever you are. If you double press the home button, you'll actually get uh, basically something that's like an app switcher. And then if you long press that button, I think what it tries to do is summon Google Assistant or Bixby. Uh, but I didn't configure it, and I didn't give it any permissions to do either of those things. So I don't know what it really does in real life. So, yeah, buttons. It's good stuff. Let's talk about the software, and that's kind of where the big part of this review shall take place. So, the Samsung watch here, the Galaxy Watch Active 1, it doesn't use Android Wear. It actually uses Tizen. Remember Tizen way back in the day? Do you remember all those episodes we used to talk about how Tizen was going to take over the world? Well, Samsung decided that's not true. But you could say Tizen was right on time for watches. So Tizen exists because at the time, there was no Android-capable, no Android-suitable interface for powering a smartwatch display. So what did Samsung wisely decide to do? Well, let's pivot Tizen into more of a niche location. Let's continue to develop it. But instead of for smartphones, let's use it for what the... the uh, better software provider couldn't provide, which is a watch OS. So what does it do? I mean, it looks really similar to any other kind of watch OS. Uh, there are watch faces, and then there are individual screens, and then there are apps that can do more stuff. So let's start kind of with the default screen, which is the time and widget spot screen. I don't know what Samsung calls this officially, on iOS, with watchOS, you could actually call it a complication. But here, I'm just going to call it a widget spot. Now, on my screen, uh, I've colored this particular watch face to be on to brand red. And then I have a, a few different complications or widgets in the four spots that it offers. Now, I have heart rate, date, steps, and sunrise or sunset. It's nice that you can customize those things, but the choices are fairly limited. And the choices are even limited to that specific watch face. So, for example, and you can be pretty sure that most watch faces will offer date and probably heart rate and steps, since that is kind of an active and fitness watch. But not everyone will offer sunset, and not everyone will offer weather, and so on. So the watch face also determines what things you can set where. Fitness apps, of course, are kind of the focus of this watch. Now, the heart rate sensor is built in, and I really like the heart rate sensor. But, uh, man, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, the fitness apps that Samsung provides eh, aren't that exciting to me, in my opinion. So, for example, we have kind of the three-ring three trick setup that Apple kind of pioneered with the watch that they made. But instead of being rings, it is instead three segments of a heart shape uh because that makes sense so we have here calories uh hours slept presumably and then minutes of activity i think that's what it's going for i've never actually seen hours in increase because i don't sleep with the watch on so i don't really know what that's going for uh now that's just one of the various apps there's there's more in here so let's see here um if we scroll along here, we can find the exercising app, uh, and this will allow you to do running, cycling, swimming, or there's a, an additional list of walking, hiking, elliptical, biking, step machine, treadmill, lunges, crunches, squats. Wow, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, so there's tons of options. Wow, that's extensive. Uh, mountain climbing, push-ups, leg pressing. Um, wow, more than I thought. But you know what? I never do any of those things. Uh, I do some walking, so that's good. I'm glad I, glad I paid a... Well, I'm glad somebody can pay $150 for a watch that is all about climbing mountains. And then we have the Stress Screen app, which is... Presumably it's taking 
your heart rate and maybe temperature or something, and it's suggesting that I breathe. I'm in the red right now. I'm, I'm working. It's hard. Podcasting difficult. Uh, the the beats per minute of my heart, the heart rate monitor. I like it a lot. I think it's a lot of fun. I wish that more like I wish that a heart rate monitor was actually something you could get in a kind of a dumb watch format. That is that's just it. Like it's just a heart rate monitor for heart rate and sleep monitoring. That's kind of and I guess steps. Like I don't even know if I need the screen at that point. I don't know. So those are kind of the fitness apps that are built in that I kind of have in all the screens. And then after that I have a weather app. And this is Samsung Weather though. And it says here that it's 57. Uh I'll I'll have to let you know that well, as I record this on November 3rd, 2019, it is certainly not 57. So I don't know what it's going on going on there for. Uh the weather app also doesn't source data from Dark Sky, which is my preferred data app for weather data. Kind of a bummer in my opinion. So after that we have uh my Google Calendar integration. But I also needed to pass that through Samsung permissions to get it from my phone to the watch, which is kind of spooky. Not a big fan of that. I mean, if it had been an Android Wear watch, presumably the calendar data would have just come in by signing into my Google account. So that's neither neither great nor, nor terrible, I suppose. Uh, so let's see, what else do we have? Um, yeah, that's kind of it. Now, in addition to those apps, we also have some of the other built-in Samsung apps. So, for example, we have a Find My Phone app. So if you have a Samsung app or maybe you've installed the Samsung spyware on your own phone, you can find my phone easily enough. And that's kind of cool. You can download more apps from the Galaxy Store. Uh, you can uh, integrate an alarm. You have contacts. You have... Uh, Basically, Samsung email, not Gmail. Um, allegedly, you have a photo gallery, but again, storage would be very limited, so that's probably not so useful. Um, Samsung Pay, uh, Spotify, and the World Clock. Very, very large selection of apps here. So, so basically, there there are a few vendors that actually have the ability to put their app on the device if they've made a customized Tizen app. That's great for them. So. Sleep is Android uh, is a is a alarm app that I personally use, and that does have an integration with the watch. But in order to use it with your phone, you install another special app. That's kind of a bummer about that too. Okay, so uh, messages is something that we need to cover because messages flow right into how notifications work out on the watch. So messages, the Samsung app for the watch. Now, you can use this to send text messages through your phone. That's kind of a standard feature. It's kind of cool. Great. But what else can you do? So to make a new message, you can scroll over to your Messages app, and you can start a new message if you want to. And it seems to be in um, you know favorites to most recently used order. So that's pretty good. So let's say you want to message somebody, and maybe you've already been chatting with them. You have three options by default. You can do voice dictation, which is cool. It uses Bixby voice dictation services, though. Uh, you can do you can just send an emoji or an icon of some sort. So that's fine. I mean, I, I guess if you uh, get asked, uh, what time are you coming home for dinner tonight? And you send an eggplant, uh, everybody will know exactly what you mean. And then finally, you can do uh, sort of the most interesting of the two features, you can choose whether to type something or you can try drawing letters by hand. So if I draw an R, it knows to write an R. Uh, when you do this, you uh, realize that uh, figuring out what a person scribbles with their very large finger on a very small screen is very difficult. Or you can simply just use the very microscopic keyboard that they put on the screen. None of those options sound good, in my opinion. So I I would not use this much. 
Alternatively, you can use kind of like the T9, K9 keyboard approach where you, you triple press letters to kind of get uh, words. Now, if none of that was good enough for you, there is actually some more options. They have a list of canned responses like yes, no, maybe, later, and so on. If you scroll down from the three baseline options, and that's cool. Okay, so all of that's about Samsung messages. Now, what happens if you get a notification? Can you do something with it? Well, if it's your SMS app, sure you can. You can send an SMS back using Samsung messages. But what else? Well, it does turn out that, for example, some apps can be interacted with, even though they don't have a true Tizen app ready to go. So, for example, Telegram, my preferred messaging platform of this current time, does not have a Tizen app, which is fine. But you can still use the reply feature to reply based on the built-in reply function in that notification on the Android device that you have connected to it. That does not mean you can initiate a Telegram message, though. What that means is you are pretty much restricted to just using it as a reply tool. So the final note here is the true lack of apps makes this so not useful. Sure, it's great at telling the time, and it's kind of cool to have a smartwatch that's connected to the internet in some way, and it's cool to get some notifications every now and then, and it's certainly cool to get your calendar invites and events to buzz on your arm. But because it doesn't have Slack, and because it doesn't have true Telegram support, and because it's kind of this weird non-first-party implementation, it's just not enough. So I would say Android or Bust, but Wear is also a Bust. And if you wanted a real smartwatch, and not like a special fitness tracker with the, you know, sideline feature of bringing notifications to your wrist, you really should just get an Apple Watch. If you want the best experience for this kind of uh, device, the Apple Watch is the place to go. And there you go. That's the uh, very short review of the exciting Samsung Galaxy Watch Active 1. You can find me, of course, just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMR. And, of course, on my website, RyanRapperside.com. You can find our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, and you can leave us comments. And, of course, you can support us at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. Real quick thing before you go, it's almost time for the annual Project for Awesome, and the Nexus will be participating again. So what the heck is the Project for Awesome? Uh, the Project for Awesome is a community-driven annual fundraiser for charities that was started in 2007 by Hank and John Green. They do a 48-hour live stream gathering donations from the community, and then the donations are split between charities that are chosen by the community. So... How does the community choose? Well, online creators, such as yours truly, promote a charity that they think is doing important work and encourage their audience to go and vote for that charity on the Project for Awesome website. And we here at the Nexus chose... The Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now, to explain what the Electronic Frontier Foundation does, I think there's no better place to look than just to read from their mission statement. When freedoms in the networked world come under attack, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is the first line of defense. EFF broke new ground when it was founded in 1990, well before the internet was on most people's radar, and continues to confront cutting-edge issues defending free speech, privacy, innovation, and consumer rights today. From the beginning, EFF has championed the public interest in every critical battle affecting digital rights. EFF fights for freedom primarily in the courts, bringing and defending lawsuits even when that means taking on the U.S. government or large corporations. By mobilizing more than 50,000 concerned citizens through our action center, EFF beats back bad legislation. In addition to advising policymakers, EFF educates the press and public. As we were discussing which charity we wanted to support, all of the Nexus hosts were on board with choosing the EFF. Here are Ryan and Brian's thoughts on the subject. 
Hey everyone, this is Ryan. You might have heard technology is important these days. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's goal, its mission, is to raise funds for education, lobbying, and litigation in areas relating to digital speech, freedom, and privacy. All of those things are things that I believe in, and I hope you believe in those things too. My role in this is to help create great software to help society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation's role in this is to make sure technology stays great for society. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is one of the best examples that I can think of of an organization that continuously fights for the user. They center their goals around freedom of speech, privacy, creativity and innovation, transparency, international and security. They've helped create tools like HTTPS Everywhere and the Let's Encrypt CertBot, as well as taken issues to court against the federal government, the FCC, and the world's largest entertainment and electronics companies. The EFF website is quite extensive and is filled with guides, news, and other posts on all of the topics that they support. I think a digital rights foundation like the EFF is one of the most important groups that we can support to help every user of technology in today's digital world. All right, time for your calls to action. What do I want you to do? Uh, Number one, tune into the Project for Awesome live stream from noon December 6th to noon December 8th Eastern Time. Two, vote for the EFF on the Project for Awesome website. And three, donate some money directly to the EFF and or to the Project for Awesome. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological convergence. Convergence.